Hey everybody, Rich Monroe here with BNB Investing Group. Uh, thanks for jumping on this week. Uh, just as a reminder, BNB Investing Group, we kind of navigate the landscape of short-term rentals. Uh, whether you're trying to manage properties, do master leasing, uh, or acquisitions. And so we kind of help investors and clients get started uh, to grow a scalable short-term rental business. And uh, with that, uh, on these weekly uh, calls, we typically like to talk to folks that are already in the marketplace. So I've got my friend Robert here from uh, Sweet Stays Atlanta that's going to be chatting with us about his business. Robert, thanks so much for jumping on today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, those of you that are jumping on, if you could just throw a quick yes in the comments for me, just let me know that you can hear us okay, and we'll just kind of go ahead and get started. Um, so, Robert, I'd love to hear a little bit about, uh, you know, I've known you for many, many years and um, haven't really heard, like, your beginnings. You know, how did you get started in this business? Well, yeah, and if you remember, you're one of the first people that uh, I consulted whenever I started looking at this to even get in the short-term business. Um, I had been in the long-term rental business for got almost well 30 years. And um, so I had a company uh, called title one management um, here in, in the Atlanta market. And we managed um, about 500 properties uh, all over Atlanta, but they were all long-term rentals. And of course I've been an investor myself for 30 years and I've got about 50 of my own properties. And um, so you know, I'm just kind of burned out in the long-term space. And I started looking for a way to, I was not in the day-to-day -day for quite some time and, you know, the last many years and, uh, but I still need something to do. So I started looking at short-term when a friend of mine told me I could make good money at it. And I was like, there's no way, I mean, there can be any money in it because I mean, hell, it's hard enough to make money, <laughs> you know, with a long-term rental um who's got one tenant every four or five years and i was like just the thought of having one tenant tenant um uh, you know every week or you know every few days just was like insanity to me and um so anyway i've rejected that for a while but you know the guy kept at me and uh then i started doing a little bit of research came and talked to you and uh talked to several other people and uh and I was like, well, we'll give it a shot. I was kind of too chicken to do it on my own units at first. So my very first deal was an arbitrage. Uh, I did a, a condo in Buckhead that we had just uh, evicted the tenant out of. And, uh, and of course, she screwed the owner out of a ton load of money and cost him a fortune. So we already looked like crap to this guy. But uh, so I couldn't possibly look any worse. And <laughs> I told him that... Uh, and I just flat out told him, I said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll master lease it. I'm going to try this short term thing and, and told him, I said, you know, I got no clue what I'm doing, but uh, I said, but I'll pay the rent. Unlike the tenant that we put in there before. And he was like, sounds good to me. Thanks. And that was it. <laughs> what was the, what was the rental amount? Uh, I paid 1200 a month there. It was a little con con nice location too. And uh, just a kind of a, crappy apartment complex converted from the, you know, back in the eighties or nineties, uh, into condos and, uh, and about 1200 in my first. And of course this was in, you know, 2019, 2020 where things were doing, still doing really good. I mean, we were knocking down, I, I want to say my first month or two, we were at four grand and then it, it never got above like 6,600. I don't think, but that's still pretty, dope, you know, pretty dang good. Um, and I was like, wow, this is great. And then the unit next door to it came vacant and I rented that one. And, um, so we did, we were kind of off to the races there. So learned, yeah, learned a lot. Yeah. Right. It's there. Definitely. A, it's definitely a domino effect. Uh, once you get one or two under your belt and, uh, you know, typically the relationship that you have with that existing landlord, they see how great the property ends up being. There's yeah. no issues with the payment being on time and, there's not a whole lot of complaints going on uh, like they have with their long-term tenants. And uh, before you know it, they're waving everything under the sun in front of you, right? So they got this one coming up for lease. So you're interested in adding that one to the mix. And uh, before you know it, you're, I mean, we did that in the first year. We went from like one unit to 10 units uh, yeah. within an eight month window. Yeah. And it's so funny because I see a lot of the guy. you know, when arbitrage was like a hot thing, I guess it's still a hot thing, but um, maybe less so today, but, um, 
people, I would always see people online. You know, I was constantly on YouTube looking at everybody who called themselves a guru, uh, just kind of learning whatever I could learn. But it always seemed like that was the big sticking point was, you know, here's how you convince an owner to do this and convince somebody to do that. And, and I was like, holy crap, I got owners falling out of my pocket. I, mean, I got those <laughs> everywhere. And, you know, I was like, I don't need to convince anybody. And, you know, I'm, they're, they're begging me to do it. But, Absolutely. Um, but I think it was all coming at it, though, because me being in professional property management for so long and just my philosophy of doing it. I mean, it's like literally I do know what I'm doing. In property management, I may not have known diddly squat about short term, but I learned real quick. And um, and it was just easy. That part was the easiest part was getting the mm-hmm. Right. But, uh, yeah. The, the harder part is the, as you know, you, you got to be on steroids with your cleaning operation, your maintenance, oh, uh, yeah. you know, definitely compared to the, the lax world of long term rentals where oh, you can take a couple of days to address things. You got to be a couple hours in this case. Right. Yeah. For yeah. Keeping that five star yeah, we, review up. <laughs> yeah, we definitely uh, did not. Yeah, we we're like anybody, you know. We experienced every possible problem, you know, that you could have in the first year or two. And you know, I think during our, I think it was our, I know it was within my first year of business. Uh, you know, we had ended up having a double homicide at one of our units. Not that one, but uh, we had taken a unit uh, right a few blocks from Mercedes Benz Stadium. Uh, clearly not in a wonderful area, but, um, and had an issue there. And that was just like, man, what else can go wrong? You know? And, and then again, that was a long-term owner who wanted to convert it to short-term and uh, never had a problem as a long-term unit. And, but then we had part, you know, it was parties and all this stuff. And um, so yeah, had- your, your units were in the news a couple of times. Say again. Not for a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny because on a Saturday morning, I woke up and I get a call from, uh, you know, I don't remember the guy's name, you know, like, hey, this is Detective so and so from Atlanta Homicide. And I was like, yeah, bullshit. You know, who is this really? You know? And uh, he's like, no, seriously, this is Detective, well, you know, whatever from Atlanta Homicide. And I was like, ooh, uh, this, this can't be a good, this can't be a good phone call. And he said, well, um, yeah, it's not a good one. So, so you were off to the races with those first few properties uh, through rental arbitrage. And then what, what from there, what, what kind of got you into uh, doing the management side of things? Well, you know, I was converting my own units, my own long-term rentals. I wanted to immediately convert to, once I saw that it could make money, um, that I started trying to convert my existing long-term rentals as my long-term tenants moved out. I wanted to convert as many of those as I could. I'm still doing that today because I've kept buying houses too in the meantime and um, and renovating them and convert them. But um, I, I started doing that. And then obviously it's a natural progression for me, right? I, I've been in the management business for this long. So mm-hmm. um, I already had owners, hundreds of owners that work for, you know, that were clients of mine who were asking about either asking about short-term rentals or, we were now pitching them that, um, you know, when you're in the long-term management space, it's a very commoditized type deal, right? And whenever people are calling up seeking a quote on management or whatever, they very rarely will stay on the phone long enough to find out why are you different? It's just like, how much do you charge? How much do you charge? Right. And, yeah. um, and that's a bad thing, right? Because you can never, you, you never want to be a commodity, but um So I went from selling standard long-term management to now selling long-term management, short-term management, pad split, master lease, you know. So what, what was your, what was your, what's your rate for long-term management? Uh, Long-term management, we had three different rates, but it ranged around eight to 11%. And then what about your short-term? 25. Yeah. I don't 25. 25. And it's a vacation type property, it would probably be 30. So. Yeah, no, we, we're the same. I mean, it's, you'd never want to try to budge off of that number, uh, you know, in order yeah. to be, you know, profitable. Uh, there's a reason why it's a higher number than the long term. There's a lot more involved operationally and you want to make sure that your expenses are covered. And, uh, you know, we've got investors that have 20 properties that we manage for them and uh, it's 25%. Uh, it's, there's no That's like volume discount or anything, right? So it's across the board. Yeah. So uh, it's important to be consistent on that. Um, so yeah. a, as you have moved forward, 
Uh, you mentioned you're converting everything over. Have you kind of um, downsized your long-term clients and you have mostly short-term rental clients now? Is that what's happened with the business? Yeah. So I actually sold uh, Title One Management uh, last year to uh, a company called Pure right? <laughs> um, <laughs> out of California. And they ended up hiring me back to do some uh, operational stuff for their company. And um, so that, that kind of took away the long-term portfolio from me. Um, obviously I'm, I'm clearly still involved, but, um, but a lot of that day-to-day -day stuff had been taken off of me. And then I was able to just to focus on the short term, but, um, but I still had my, my still business development operation, all that stuff was still set up. And, um, and remember, I, I mean, I still had a real estate brokerage and I still had my maintenance company and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I still had plenty to do, but, but yeah, I've tried to focus just on short term really. And cause I enjoy it uh, again, like I said, I was kind of burnt out on long term, and, and I'm, I, even though I was fond of the get rich, slow landlord business, and I still am a big believer in that. Um, but you know, making two or $300 a month net and you being happy with that, uh, and I, and I was for literally 25 years. Uh, now when I look at it, I'm like, holy crap, that kind of sucks. I mean, that's, a, that's like get rich I at mean, a sales pace. All, right? all it takes is one AC to go out or one yeah, and you're done. repairing and you're done for the year. Like for yeah, many years right. in some or cases. one tenant who, you know, and I've done everything, dude, I've done owner finance. I've done, hell I've got, uh, I think I've got 25 or 30 subject twos. I mean, I've done every iteration. I've done trailers. I've done land. I've done um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's get rich slow at a snail's pace. And then once I discovered this is much better and, but going in, I even told myself and I've told my owners this, um, if I didn't make one penny more on short term than I do on long term, I'd still do short term. And the reason is, is because look at the advantages. I don't have any evictions. I don't have bad checks. I don't have collection problems. I don't have security deposit disputes. I'm not my rehabbing property, the property. <laughs> yeah, my property looks like it could be put on the MLS tomorrow at any right. day of the week and be sold. And guess what? If I did decide to sell it, which I would never, ever sell, and I would encourage any of your listeners, I, you're crazy if you sell property. You need to be buying property, never sell. Um, but if I did have to sell, guess what? I don't have to wait on a lease to run out or deal with a tenant to get them out and then go in and renovate it to get it ready for sale. My property is ready for sale right now, today. Put for, yeah, put it for sale sign in the yard, throw it on MLS. I've already got professional photos, <laughs> right? I mean, they're already, they're already ready to go. Coordinate showings in between check-ins and checkouts, and you're, you're good. Yeah. So, But as you learn as an investor, you never, ever, ever sell. If you need money, you go borrow money. And you yep. borrow against your equity, but you never sell. And absolutely. Advice, but. So, how many short-term rentals are you currently managing? Uh, we've got forty-eight or forty-nine. I, we did have fifty, I think, and then we had we had a couple of owners who were kind of falling out on when things have slowed down a little bit. Um, which is, you know, that's just natural part of the business. So, right. Uh, what's we're, what's, we're what's your and so what, what does your operation look like to support 40, 48 listings, you know, as compared to the long-term rental world? Yeah. So we have, um, I've got a main virtual assistant, um, who was in Mexico now in Texas. Um, and he is kind of like my back office. He's kind of like the general manager, um, for that. And then I've got a, and some of these people, I, I could do it a different way, but I've kind of inherited them whenever I got rid of my uh, other company and I moved some people around because I'm trying to scale myself to get bigger. So I, instead of just laying off my marketing guy at Title One, because Pure did not need that marketing guy and Pure did not need two, two more bookkeepers and stuff like that, I brought those people to do work between multiple companies. So um, so I've got some guys that work part-time doing marketing, part-time doing accounting. Uh, and those, those guys are in Mexico. Um, I've got some people in the Philippines that answer the phones 16 hours a day, seven days a week. We're not at 24 hours a day yet, but, um, I haven't really seen the need for it. 
Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Philippines, but this tended to work out just right as far as price. And, uh, and they, they actually perform well. I, I'm surprised. Yeah, and, our, our, our team is from the Philippines that we've been using for the past four years. Yeah. I, I, was skeptical. I, I actually lived in the Philippines for a while, and I, I love the people, but they're just too damn polite. And <laughs> Americans are not polite, and uh, we're direct, right? And we want people mm -hmm. to get to the point and don't call me sir 16 times during a phone call and don't repeat what I said nine times. Just give me the answer, right? Yeah. And, uh, but they tend to do really well, and um, so I like them, and the price is right. So, so I've got those guys, and then I've got um, – I had a couple of girls that are kind of my boots on the ground. They kind of do a little bit of everything. And they're, they might jump in if they're, if the cleans can't get handled by the cleaners, we outsource all the cleans. Um, but if they can't, if, if something happens, right. And they need a little bit of help, they may jump in on that. Plus we have owners that come to us and say, Hey, you know, I've got an empty house here. Here's a check, go furnish it, which baffles me. I boggle my mind that somebody who doesn't even know me from Adam would hand me a blank check and say, here, yeah. go, you know, go spend 50 or 60 grand on a house. I'm yeah. like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, so those, you know, pass, uh, passive investors that don't want to do the work, they're happy to yeah. write the check, you know? Absolutely. So those two girls kind of do that. They're doing the, the tiny minor maintenance or the minor guest services stuff, like restocks of the properties and, um, and, you know, and that type of thing. But they're also doing the furnishing of properties when we have new, you know, an owner who wants us to, outfit and furnish a property, which that's time consuming. And we're, we try to make it, you know, really streamlined, but it's tough. And, yeah. uh, and they're kind of overseeing uh, the laundry operation, which, you know, I've told you my problems with it. I've called you for advice on that. Yeah. But, uh, Cause the oh, linens wait, wait, and laundry. Yeah. yeah where are you currently at with that? I know you wanted to bring that in house and you were set up to do that. And where'd you end up with it? Yeah. So it got, you know, I, the iteration was, I don't know how other people start, but you know, we were doing it all downstairs in my kitchen for a while. I ruined one very expensive washer and dryer, uh, <laughs> ruined that. And then I was like, all right, this doesn't work. And, and no joke, I've got eight feet tall of linens in my kitchen of just the, the washer dryer never went off 24 <laughs> seven. And, um, and that worked for a while, but it was driving me crazy. And, then I was like, all right, then I'm just going to, I'm going to take a house that I have in a neighborhood that's kind of commercial. And I'm just going to get on Facebook marketplace. I'm going to buy a bunch of dang washers and dryers and stick it in there and just go pay somebody to go over there and wash stuff and dry it all day long. Uh, that works for the dryers, by the way, it works great. Uh, regular gas, as long as the dryers are gas. Um, the, uh, so I did that, but the washers, can't handle it. Right. I mean, they cannot, they're not designed to work that much and they tear up within a month or two and you're having to buy new equipment. And then I ended up looking for commercial equipment. I don't know if anybody out there has ever priced that, but you'll soon, you'll quickly find that one commercial washing machine is upwards of 25 grand. It's like buying um, a car. Yeah, it is. Now the beauty of it is they're designed to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next 15 years. Um, literally. And, uh, but it's also just not buying it and then putting it in. I mean, it's buying it, making sure you've got a six inch concrete reinforced slab to sit it on. You've got three phase, 240 volt power. You've got a gas Me? line that's yeah. big. You've got two, you know, electric, you know, it, there's a lot to it. Right. Uh, anyway, long story short, uh, that did not work out for me very well because of the infrastructure cost. So I just went and bought a laundromat. And uh, so I bought a laundromat local to where our office is in the same town. Um, and that's, that is my commercial laundry. So nice. So is that, is it actually profitable besides the Airbnb business as well? Well, it was until I closed it. To the public. <laughs> but uh, oh, so you're strictly just doing the Airbnb. Stuff yeah, I closed right? it to the public and because we had so much volume that there really was no room for the public to use it, but I will now, we're, we're kind of getting our feet under us now. So I'm going to open it back up to the public because it sure would be nice for it to pay for itself. Right. At least pay the rent and something else. Because well, what, what what you should do is open it up to other short-term rental managers. I thought about that. Um, 
but I'm almost thinking I've got to have some sort of delivery mechanism and maybe I could do yeah. that, but because it's located in Cartersville, Georgia, you know, that's it just happens where that's where I live and, and that's where our operation is kind of headquartered. But, um, but yeah, maybe that's an idea. I don't know, but the stuff, so, you know, it gets expensive. I just replaced yesterday a, uh, you know, you go replace a water heater in a, in a laundromat and a cheap one is six or seven grand. Yeah. And, uh, so it's a, uh, I just replaced that. So, so what, what about the location of your properties? Are they all in Georgia or are they kind of spread out? Are they regional? What's the makeup look all, like? All of mine are in metropolitan Atlanta, but I try to stay out of uh, in town. I, I know you kind of specialize in in town, I think, or I think you do, um, or you've got a mix anyway. Yeah. Uh, I have never been somebody who knew that market ultra well. Uh, for short term, I knew it well for long term, but uh, and I and there's so much competition that I was just like, you know what, I fit better. You know, I'm kind of a country mouse, so let me stay in the suburbs. And I've done really well in uh, Bartow, Cobb, Cherokee, Paulding. Uh, you know, I've done some stuff in the perimeter, it worked fine, but um. And that, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, especially folks that are more accustomed to long-term rentals don't really get that, you know, this short-term rental opportunity, you could throw a dart anywhere in the suburbs and it, it works just as well as it does in the middle of downtown or midtown. And, you know, that's really the beauty of it. It gives you that flexibility to kind of have that as an option. And, you know, we've got properties up in the north suburbs of Georgia that do five, 6,000 a month in revenue that are three and four bedroom houses that, you know, who would have thought out in the middle of nowhere, you're 45 got, minutes from the airport. <laughs> I've got two that, that are in South Georgia. And <clears throat> anybody who lives here who's driven to South Georgia, like past Callaway Gardens down that area, dude, there's nothing for miles. I mean, it's just, guess what? They're short term rentals and they work. Um, yeah. You know, not, are they my highest grossing properties? No. But, but there's always, if they're, if, if, what I've always told people who are prospects, at least, and I'm like, is there a hotel in your town? And if they say yes, and I'm like, then there's demand, right? Yeah. I mean, somebody's coming there for something, right? Yeah. And, you know, and we do really well in, in my little area. Uh, you know, I have a bunch of properties in Cartersville because, hello, I live here and I own a bunch. So um, I do really well with those. And we, you know, I don't need to dominate everywhere. I just need to do well in, in a little small area. So, so what, what's your outlook for the future, Robert, in terms of growth? Are you looking to grow, continue to grow management, uh, buy more for yourself, combination? You know, what's your strategic goals going forward? Uh, all of the above at the moment. Um, I'll still do, if a, if a good arbitrage deal comes up, I'm interested. I just looked at, I just turned down eight, eight units in uh, Marietta uh, for arbitrage that an owner came to me about. But it just wasn't as sweet of a deal as I need to make. And in today's economy, I need it to be a little bit better. And uh, so I'm still looking at those. I'm obviously trying to buy more property, but, you know, good luck with that, right? Trying to find a deal on something right now is damn near impossible. Um, but the economy will change. I mean, it'll it'll change. And, uh, and then, but I'm going to continue growing the management. Uh, you know, I'm not doing that gangbusters. I, I think at first I was really concerned about trying to grow really fast, but, and, and in a lot of businesses that can be really detrimental. Well, guess what? This is one of them. So do not yeah. grow fast unless yeah. you really want to lose your butt and, and not perform well. I mean, the, the systems that are required in this business are just massive. Right. I mean, and, and I still haven't figured out some of them. Uh, and I, and I know you haven't either. And I've talked to other people who are 10 times mm -hmm. our size and they haven't either. I'm um, learning every week, every month, yeah. learning something new for sure. Yeah. I mean, you and I uh, speak at a lot of different conferences on short-term rentals and, uh, and I travel the country for uh, pure and, uh, you know, and I've spoke at conferences for years, but whenever I talk to these guys who are doing short-term that exponentially larger than us, and I'm thinking, oh, surely to God, you know, they've got the laundry situation figured out. <laughs> and I'm going to go and ask them. And you get get them at the bar and they're like, dude, <laughs> that, we don't have a clue. We're just barely getting by with it. I'm like, what? I was like, you're a $50 million company. What are you talking about? And they're like, nope. 
So, it, you know, don't knock yourself out that you think that it's bad that you haven't figured it out because the big guys haven't either. And uh, it's there's there is no just perfect system. And but boy, if you got to fix the stuff, you really got to take care of cleaning and linens. I mean, because yeah. those scale really rapidly as you grow and and it can get out of control. I mean, it really can. Yeah. So how selective are you with uh, with new clients, with management on the short term mental side? Uh, fortunately, I have had the benefit of being a property manager for, you know, 25 or 30 years. And I have uh, and I'm blessed that I am not living hand to mouth. Uh, everybody who gets in the business in any business usually does what they take any client. Right. If somebody can fog a mirror. They, they're my customer. Right. And we all do that. It's always a huge mistake, but we don't, we, we know, um, we, we know it is, but we're also like, dude, I got to make some money here. I got to make a living. And so yeah. we take what we can. And then until that, those clients wear us out and we're like, man, I never should have taken them. So I was lucky that I was in a pretty good spot. Um, and I've been able to say, no, nope, you're either going to do it my way uh, and by talking to you, too. I, I talked to you about that. Yeah. Um, because, and you and I are on the same page. I mean, you can the minute that you start to deviate from your policy. And what I always told owners when I was in the long term space was I had built a super highway of processes and procedures and policies. Right. And it really functions efficiently. And I said, you're wanting to take me off of down a dirt road. And if you do, you're going to mess up my operation for my other customers. And I can't allow you to do that. So some things it does have to be my way or the highway. And uh, or I make it so financially. Uh, Worth your time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, now, if you want to take me off down that dirt road, you know, I'll right. come and dance a gig on your front porch for the right amount of money. But right. You know, but you're going to have to pay. And most owners are like, oh, well, OK, it's not that important. And then they yeah. kind of get in line on our process. And uh, yeah, it's it's really it's important. very it's, yeah, it's very difficult when you're starting out and you're growing a management business yeah. and you recognize the opportunity. But you're going to be able to tell very quickly in those initial conversations with that owner whether they're going to be a problem child or not. And yep. so you know, really going to do yourself a big favor by making those decisions early on instead of engaging and having to fire them later, um, which I've done a couple of times. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's better to kind of go with your gut in the beginning. And if you sense that that person's going to be, you know, overreaching or micromanaging, uh, you don't, you know, you're not going to, you're going to spend, you know, most of your time managing that one client when you've got, you know, 50 others to worry about. And so you've kind of got to, take it on the chin and accept that and cut your losses sooner than later. Because uh, if you get, if you get a couple of those in your portfolio, it's just going to make your life miserable. Right. So not just your life, dude, your reputation. Remember it, mm -hmm. in our business, in the typical management business, or at least the way I would teach it would be, guess what? Everything's on my account, right? We, everything yep. goes in my name. We're in control of everything. Well, guess what? It's also in your name. So now you're the one who suffers. If this guy does something stupid, now you're the one who gets the bad review. Um, or if you can't, let's say that you overcommit and you're like, oh, God, sure, I can go to Athens and do that. And by the way, I speak from experience. I was like, sure, yeah, we can do Athens. And uh, um, but we had no clue, you know, and uh, and we fixed it now. But but that was a problem. You stretch yourself thin. You uh, really screw up your staff. Now your staff started to get pissed off because you're like, well, they're like, what are you thinking, dude? We can barely handle this. And, and you don't need to go everywhere. You don't, nobody wants to turn away business, but the smart businessman learns what to turn away. And it doesn't just yeah. have to be a bad owner. It can just be not the right deal. Yeah. And, and it sucks. I mean, it's hard to, to see that money walk away somewhere else. But I mean, unless you want to work for $2 an hour, uh, and drive yourself crazy and answer the phone at three in the morning and, and just have problems and, and have your staff pissed off. You can't, you can't do it. You, you've really yeah. got, to, you've got to focus. Right. So I'm sure you get a lot of your business from referrals as for as long as you've been in the space, but what are some, can you drop us some nuggets on kind of, you know, the way, what's some good prospecting for someone starting out to, 
you know, get engaged and find clients that are interested in, in getting a short-term rental manager? Well, I mean, obviously you could pay for leads. I mean, that's kind of expensive, but um, I think that if I were going to do um, it, well, if you're trying to get owner clients, we're talking about owners or tenants or, or guests, I would assume owners. Uh, oh, owners, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if it were me, and, and I, I'm very uh, biased about this one myself, is believe it or not, property managers that, and the kind of the dirty little secret at least, and I am mega involved in the Atlanta uh, property management scene. I have hundreds of property manager friends. I have served as the president of a trade organization for Atlanta, and I've just been in it forever. And I know them all. I know everything about the business. Nobody wants to touch short term rentals. Right. No property manager wants to touch them with a 10 foot pole, and including me for many years. And once I learned, and now I'm like, yeah, you know, that short term <laughs> business does kind of suck. What you should do is send it to me. And I'll take it because I'm, you know, I don't know any better. I'm stupid. So if I were going to go out and look for clients, I would contact property managers and because they've got owners who want to do it. Yeah. Well, property managers, yeah. turn it away. And property managers and real estate agents, right? So Well, well that get, was my next part was yeah. the professional manager is somebody who's already getting people called him saying, hey, we manage my property. Yeah. And a property manager, who, and they're saying, yeah, what about short term? Like, yeah, we don't do that. Thanks. Click. It, when they could be sending that to you. But then, like you said, real estate agents, uh, I'm a broker, uh, an, you know, obviously a real estate broker in Georgia and Alabama. And uh, real estate agents are another, I think, incredible opportunity because all they care about for the most part is making that sale. But they want to be the man. You know, everybody's got a guy, right? They want the Rolodex. You know, yeah, they want you yeah. in that Rolodex when yeah. they, oh, you got you know anybody who does short-term rentals? Oh, I've got a guy, right? And you want to be that guy. Yeah. And and there's no short, uh, last time I looked, there were 88,000 uh, realtors in Georgia, or real estate agents, not realtors. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you can't swing a cat without hitting a real estate agent. So, you know, you shouldn't have any problem finding, finding those guys. Yeah. So what I, I was interested to see your opinion on, you know, some states are, are starting to require, uh, you know, real estate license to be able to do short term rental property management. Um, a lot of states don't have that requirement. Um, you know, being that you're licensed, being that you've you've come from the property management space, what's your opinion about that in terms of, you know, going forward or what, what, what do you see happening there? Well, there's my opinion, and then there's probably what's going to happen. So my opinion is easy. If it involves the government, uh, then my answer is no, they shouldn't be involved. I don't think any license, there, there should be a no license for anything, um, in my opinion. So it's just never a guarantee of anything other than a way for you to hand the government money. Um, you know, it, And if a license meant anything, then guess what? We'd never have any uh, malpractice claims, right? Right. But, mm -hmm. but we do. So the license didn't mean anything. They still screwed up. So um, so that's my personal opinion. Uh, is that how it's ever going to work? No, it's not. And in Georgia, uh, you're lucky in Georgia that there is no license required in Georgia. However, if you are a licensed uh, real estate agent, then you fall under a different set of rules. Right. So there's an exemption in Georgia if you're not licensed. But if you are a licensee, then you fall under all the same rules that bro brokers do. Right. And believe me, they're, they're a, a numerous <laughs> rules. Uh, yeah. rule. It's a lot. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. So, um, but honestly, the way you should operate is you should operate the way that the law makes yeah. brokers yeah. operate anyway, with trust accounts and things like that, yeah. because that's the correct way to do it. And it keeps you out of trouble and potentially out of court um, you know, and you really need insurance, whether or not you're licensed, you still need professional liability insurance. Right. So, uh, I mean, cause you get sued and you think it's a no joke, dude, if, if you've never been sued, then you haven't been in business long enough. Um, right. I don't know if Rich has ever been sued, but I've been sued dozens of times, dozens. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Thankfully I have not been sued yet in, in the real estate space in my former life in the finance world, I was sued, but uh, yeah, it's just so a I, know what, I know what that experience is like. Yeah, yeah. It's the numbers. And it, and it just so happens that the reason I've been sued so much is I've been in real estate and that is a very high profile, high litigation industry. And you're in it. If you're in short term rental, you're in the real estate business, whether you know it or not. So, yeah. and think about all the liability, a tenant could slip and fall. They could set the house on fire. 
They could get hit by a bus while they were staying at your unit. They could cut themselves on a, a broken glass. There's a million things that could happen that could end you up in court. So you better have uh, some good, good insurance. Yeah, totally agree. It's not that expensive for the annual premium right. to get liability coverage for one or $2 million policy. So yeah, definitely and worth it. it. Well, and remember too, I mean, if something happens and you're managing a property, you got to, you better make sure that owner's got the correct insurance on his right. property. Because what you'll also discover is that when push, when push to uh, comes to shove, an owner's going to say, I don't know who this guy is right here. Yeah. You know, he told me this and you're like, no, I never said any of that. They're like, Oh yeah, he lied to me. You know, So <laughs> you better have the right insurance because uh, if there's ever problems, it'll, it'll come back on you. Yeah, most so, definitely. Definitely. All right. So we're getting close to coming to a close. Is there anything else that you think we should touch on that's uh, important for somebody just starting out to wrap their head around? Um, I don't know that there, I, nothing comes to mind, but if if you're getting started, then man, you should spend some time sitting down thinking about your systems and how you intend to take it from X to Y to Z because work in one or two doors, easy peasy. You can do it from your car, do it from your house. No, no problem. You might can even go up three, four, five doors doing that. But can you do 10 doors like that? You might, but you'd be running yourself crazy. And I can assure you that you can't do 40 doors like that. That's not even possible. And you damn sure can't do 100 doors like that. So you just need to plan in advance so that you can scale. And I, I don't see a lot of people doing that sometimes. They don't, they don't try and think. Uh, they just want to sit down and do. And you really need a plan. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally agree. That, that brings us to a good closure. So, you know, I appreciate you taking the time, Robert, this week. Um, Awesome. You know, I'm, I'm, we learned a lot from you. And, uh, you know, for those of you, you know, BNB Investing Group, you know, we help investors learn more about short term rentals and uh, we can kind of customize an approach uh, for what your objectives are. So if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to reach out directly to me. Uh, we'll usually best place is Facebook Messenger and we'll schedule a quick call and chat and see uh, if you are a good fit or not. So. Robert, thanks again, buddy. I appreciate it. I'm sure we'll see each other. Um, I think there's a live event in Atlanta next week we're both going to, and uh, I may end up going to that conference in Austin too. So cool. thanks again. I appreciate you, you taking the time and, and we'll talk again soon, buddy. All right. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.